From my personal interpretation of the data, for me, he's my nap, really, of the meeting. The Final Furlong Podcast is proudly brought to you by Jeff Banks Bet. Join the excitement and sign up to Jeff Banks online now to get 10% off any net losses returned as cash after your first month of betting up to £500 at jeffbanks.bet. Welcome to the Final Forum Podcast. I'm Emma Kennedy. Great to have your company and great to be joined by the lead data analyst for Race IQ, friend of the show, Paige Fuller. Welcome back to the Final Forum. It's great to be back. It's been it, it's been a while. <laughs> it has. Aintree was the last one. And we're here to talk about national... No, we're not. We're here to talk about flat racing, which I'm fascinated by because obviously the metrics for landscape jumping kind of explains itself. These horses aren't jumping, Paige. What exactly are you giving us here? Yeah, it's been a really it's been a really fun process. I mean, I was really... like Having been steeped in national hunt from my background, obviously I hadn't quite appreciated how like quickly you get right into the weeds in the flat. Um, so it's been really interesting process, like trying out our new metrics, you know, just getting to know the whole sectional analysis, all of those sorts of things have been such an amazing learning curve, but as well as all the sort of standard sectional analysis, but bringing sort of further actual race wind time analysis. So soon we're going to be projecting par times, so expected wind times um, on racing TV. Then we've got sort of speed out the gates. So we kind of got all of the, all of the race covered. We've got speed out the gates, so not to 20 miles an hour. Obviously, sectional analysis, we've got the finishing speed percentages, which, again, we're soon going to be bringing in sort of par sectionals and par finishing speed percentages. So just so people who who are glancing at sectionals, who might go, oh, blimey, that's a lot of numbers. Like, what can we do with them? You know, we're going to be highlighting, we're going to be giving that context for you. So you can go, right, OK, that was a, you know, 13 second furlong. That's pretty slow. Or 30 second furlong is pretty fast, you know, depending on, if you're running uphill, downhill, heavy ground, quick ground. And so again, like the whole point of the project is to try and just give a bit of access to people who might not necessarily want to get into the weeds of it all, but we can give that slightly higher level interpretation of it. And it's been, yeah, really interesting. We're going to start with the race of the meeting. I think, anyway, the Sussex Stakes. Uh, betting is headed by Rosalian, 6-5 to five on favourite. He comes into this race with a very similar profile to last year's winner, Paddington, except for the fact that he was a Group 1 winning two-year-old. Paddington had done nothing, really, as a juvenile, uh, but he has won the Irish 2000 Guineas and the St. James's Palace Stakes like Aidan O'Brien's winner last year. This race has been won by some of the best that we've seen. Frankel, obviously, the Ghost, Giants Causeway, Rocket Gibraltar, Rip Van Winkle, uh, Canfor Cliffs, Kingman, Baid is Rosalian going to add his name to the winner's enclosure or is it going to be Henry Longfellow who's got a kind of a similar profile to Rip Van Winkle he's 100 to 30 with Jeff Banks bet notable speech 7 to 2 there has been support with Jeff for the Godolphin horse I want to start though with Rosalian what can you tell us and what is the race IQ data showing us from my personal interpretation of the data for me he's my nap really of the meeting like I know he's short priced like but he He's just an exceptional racehorse and he has so much speed about him. Like at Newmarket, it, it was unfortunate. I think they probably assumed that he he would stay. And I don't think like, you know, I hate criticising jockeys, but in hindsight, I'm sure Sean Levy will watch that back and go, I just hit the front a moment too soon in such a strongly run pace. He just he just put himself in the firing line of notable speech, who surprisingly like, Notable speech didn't have the profile of a horse that would necessarily stay. You know, he'd showed loads of speed through the winter on at Kempton, but in hindsight now, having seen Rosalian's run in the Curra and at Royal Ascot, he just wasn't able to use that tactical speed in the Guineas, which is the only reason why he got beat. So in height, like with if I was Sean looking back on that, I'd be going, Well, I know now how I could get beat, and I'm gonna do everything I can not to get beat. So you know, he knows the horse so much better now. Well, that means major danger for my big bet in the race, which is Henry Longfellow. I thought the dynamics of Goodwood was going to really suit him. Ryan Moore on the front, um, Aiden bringing the horse on. The fact that he's staying over a mile and taking on Rosalian again was when they could go up and trip was all pointing in the direction of, of him for me. Uh, Maybe not. We will dig in further to the data, though. Uh, you've given me a graphic for the, the St. James's Palace Stakes in the top speed. Can you take us through this? Yeah, so effectively, like when you watch St. James's Palace, Henry Longfellow was the unfortunate. He, he had a target on his back, 
and Rosalian was a bit boxed in. But actually, you know, two furlongs from home, Sean Levy just slightly went for the gap, the gap open, and he was off. And actually, all of their top speeds were reached in the second last furlong. And you can see here that Rosalian was just far quicker than any of the other horses. So he reached a top speed of 40.23 miles an hour. Henry Longfellow could only quicken up to 39.71 miles per hour and then everything else behind them was just a bit slower again. So for me, that just, the problem when you're running against a speed horse like Rosalian, who clearly stays as well, is how do you beat him? Because you are always going to have a target on your back. So I'm not sure, because if you, if you go steadier in front, then you're, again, only setting it up for his speed. But if you go too hard in front, now Sean Neeby knows that he can just sit and wait like he did at Ascot or the Curra. Like you saw that, you know, the amount of ground he made up from an impossible position in the Curra. It's just really, I, I can't, it's going to be a very tactical affair and I can't quite work out how you get Rosalian beat. Notable speech beat him in the 2000 Guineas at Newmarket. And at the time, he looked like a, a world beater. Timeform had given him the second highest rating going into the race, second only to City of Troy, who then obviously, for whatever reason, didn't run his race on the day. But to them, it wasn't a surprise that he won. Um, to most of us, it was. Like, where did this come from? And looking back on it with the benefit of hindsight, it was very unusual. He came in with three prep runs from the all-weather, so he was really hard fit. And the way you've just explained how Sean might have rethought things after that, or if that was a, a ride that he could have had again, he might have done things differently. Do you believe that performance from Notable Speech? Like, Which one do you think is the real him? Newmarket? Or Royal Ascot? So I think Newmarket's the real him. I don't think he turned up at Ascot, but I think he hit the nail on the head there as well. Rosalian was having his first start back as well, wasn't he? Like, mm. notable speech was hard fit. And he did show a lot of speed. So when I was comparing, before Royal Ascot, I was comparing the top speeds between Rosalian and notable speech and the runners in the St. James's Palace. And Rosalian was actually the horse that had posted the highest top speed. So regardless of like how much quickening notable speech had done at Kempton in the winter, which was a lot. I mean, he was finishing with finishing speed percentages of about 115% at times. Um, and then hit, like I think in one of the races, hit 41.6 miles an hour. Whereas Rosalian still in the Curra hit 41.79 in a better race. Um, and actually, so you kind of went, okay, fine. Notable speech outstayed Rosalian and he's also quicker. Hang on, no, he's not actually a quicker horse. So, you know, where notable speech after Newmarket looked like that all round a horse because he had the speed and he had the stamina. Maybe he was just the race hardened fit horse at Newmarket and actually Rosalian's come on for that run. Because again, like it's hard to get good horses fit at home. I mean, I know they, they know how to get them fit, but every horse with that speed, like you've got to gallop them pretty hard to get them hard fit first time out, haven't you? Yeah, the person who's won more guineas than anybody else is Aidan O'Brien. But for whatever reason, it's just not happening at the moment. And it, you know, obviously for August Rodin to bomb out is one thing, but for Little Big Bear to do it as well, yes, okay, they weren't quite ready. Then City of Troy bums out spectacularly this year. So there's there's something off there. Uh, Henry Longfellow didn't turn up, even if he did, given the fact that Aiden's horses clearly needed their run, especially the three-year-olds. I don't think you would have seen much of an improvement, and he clearly needed it in France anyway. Um, and the same can apply to Rosalian. Hatem had had a run. Rosalian is a better horse than Hatem, but Hatem has gone on to run a massive race in the Irish 2000 Guineas, and he was really, really good in the Jersey Stakes at, at Royal Ascot. Maybe that's more of his trip. It's a bit of a disappointment he's not in this race because he would have been uh, a fascinating contender. The ratings agencies... so. Racing Post ratings have Rosalian on 128, Henry Longfellow 127, Notable Speech the same. Time form ago, Rosalian 131, Notable Speech 130, Henry Longfellow 128. So essentially, they're saying it's between those three. Factor Cheval is on 126 time form, uh, for the record, and um, 125 on Orpiores. Do you see it between the, the big three, in which case the three-year-old Colts, and do you agree with those rating agencies that Rosalian is the best with not much between Henry Longfellow and Notable Speech. Yeah, I'd say so. I think they're all pretty close. I mean, it's one of those where either one of them could find a chink in the other arm in the other's armor, but the chink's got to be there, if you know what I mean. Hmm. So any one of them is entitled to beat the other one, but I do think Rosalian just is 
slightly better than the other two, especially over a mile. Like, there's nothing to say that, you know, in time they might get a bit further. Like, maybe notable speech, like, who knows? Maybe after this run, maybe a mile two is more his trip, especially the way that he stayed in the guineas. But, you know, he's so he's so lightly raced. You wouldn't be... It would be so interesting to see, because it, it wasn't him at Ascot, was it, at all? Um, so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I don't think it was, but I can't explain it, though. That's the thing. And I'll always forgive a horse one bad run. You can't write one off straight away. Like City of Troy was written off by somebody. Oh, he hasn't trained on. Um, so I, I'm absolutely prepared to forgive him. I just don't understand it. Everything should have panned out well for him. Maybe he wasn't ridden particularly well that day. Maybe he was asked to do way too much. And we'll see a better performance now. The dynamic of Goodwood and the fact that Henry Longfellow is going to be probably ridden handy again, I would imagine. Um, if you were to just take a look at the St. James's Palace stakes, you'd say there's no way that uh, he'll be Rosalian because he got first run on him and Sean Levy still manages to get there. Goodwood is trickier. And okay, it's not a massive field right now, as we're a few days out from the race, there's currently eight runners. It's probably not going to be an eight runner field, uh, all things considered. But it's still Goodwood. It can be tricky. And I'm fascinated by the fact that they're committing him to this race. Like he could absolutely go up in distance. I think 10 furlongs is probably going to be ideal for him later. He's one of the best bred horses in training by Dubawi out of probably the best filly Aiden O'Brien ever trained. And that's saying something in minding. As much as you're compelling, I can't quite get away from him. I can get away from August Rodin, which might be by the time this airs horribly wrong. Um, but I can't quite get away from him. That that price that Jeff is offering as well, which is 100 to 30, is just a little bit too tempting. It's on the right side to be backing. Not too short, not too big. Sounds like we need a reverse forecast on it. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I mean, it's, so, it's going to be such a good... It, I think that will be the race, but if it isn't a really good race, it will just be like... Oh no! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because it's just Unfactor Cheval gallops up. to victory. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to be such a good race, and it's nice because actually, you know, it is. It's the whole the whole meeting is like is a bit like this, and actually, it's what I've really enjoyed about looking into the data now. Is you know, as we were saying before the show, all of the jump season, you you kind of get to get a feel of all the horses as they progress through the season. It's a bit of a crescendo. Whereas actually we're only now getting these comparisons. Like only now can we actually really compare these horses like for like, cause they've been running against each other. And it's so interesting seeing these rivalries that it, they could easily not take each other on and avoid each other. And it's so nice that these trainers are just churning them out and facing up to each other. And yeah, it's going to be such a good race because of it. Yeah, how great is it that they're rematching for the second time as well? No one's ducking. They, you could go to France, you could go to America for a grade one. Godolphin are doing a lot of that lately. But no, everybody wants to rematch. Henry Longfellow for me, the data though, and Paige is basically slapping me in the face and saying, you idiot. <laughs> Rosalian can't be beaten. He's a good thing. And you've kind of given the game away. He would be your most confident pick of the week. I'd say so. But, you know, I, I'm, fully, I'm fully aware that with this level of horses... You know, the fact that Rosalian isn't odds on yet just goes to show that, you know, anything could happen. Funny you say that. He wasn't odds on until we started recording this show and the betting came through and Jeff Banks bet did go six to five on Rosalian. So he's just today, like literally an hour before we started recording the show, they went, eh, we'll cut him to odds on. And everybody else has gone and done the same thing as well. I don't think he'll be odds on on the day unless Paige Fuller and everybody else watching this show goes, hang on a second, this, this fella's buying money. Uh, it's going to be a cracking race. I can't wait to see it. It'll be live on Racing TV on Wednesday, 3.35. Tuesday, the feature race is the Alstra Cab Goodwood Stakes. I think this is pretty simple. Kiprios wins. But just to explain the data a bit more, because this is a horse who nearly died, um, this time last year, he was in a terrible state and they've managed to rebuild him, get him back and once again win a Gold Cup with him. I, was, I love this horse and I'd said to Aidan O'Brien, the fellow behind me, uh, Yates, would you try and emulate Yates by keeping him in training and at least going for a third and hopefully going for a fourth Gold Cup if he was to win a second Gold Cup? And he said, yes, as long as everybody's happy with that, he would like to do that. So hopefully that is the plan and if he stays sound, touch wood, he would be eight the same age as Yates going for a fourth. But let's get him through Goodwood first of all, shall we? He's the odds-on favourite. Um, Jeff Banks bet going... As my computer decides to freeze on me, 7-4 to four on. Uh, I can't really argue with the price. I think he should be that price. But what is the data telling us just about how good he is? 
Yeah, I think this horse, you know, take take his defeat in the Ascot Gold or the um sorry Champions Day Gold Cup, whatever the race. Too many Gold Cups um, out of it. Um, like, well, you can look at that and see how it backs backs up his ability, um, even though he was beaten. And you know, basically, it was just the f- most phenomenal ride on Trollerman from Frankie to Tory that day. I mean, it was it. It, look, it was it was an okay ride from you know I hate again I hate sort of suggesting that jockeys haven't given them great rides but you know Frankie was sat really handy that day he just bobbed along in front on Trollerman and you know it's really hard without sort of having the the sort of numbers there but basically Frankie never dropped below 13 second fur- furlong so he never went quicker than 13 second furlong so he just set a nice kind of gallop let Ryan Moore go past him and he had that energy to get back up past Ryan because Ryan had had to, he posted one, two, three, four, four sub 13 second furlongs. So he was going way quicker than Trawler Man from like six furlongs from home. And he just had to use up so much energy coming up the top of the hill as well. Like bearing in mind at Ascot, that isn't just the straight, that's coming uphill into the stiffest part of the hill round the bend posting these sub 13 second furlongs and he just he just got tired he really tied up in the end and I don't think the best horse won that day so take that out of it you know he should have won that day mm-hmm. so actually you know he he was the best horse then and if it wasn't for that I think everyone would have just been like yeah he would be absolutely bolts up at Royal Ascot like most people do, do say that anyway but I mean he is just a phenomenal racehorse and yeah I can't I can't see what would beat him. Like most of these are bummed out last time. So there's nothing really there. True Shan won't run because it's going to be too quick. It's going to be 28 degrees and he, he won't run. Um, and then nothing else is just put any close to its form. Coltrane won't win. A, like he's never won a group one. And you sort of think, is he, is he actually going to win a group one? Because if you haven't done by now, like are you going to be able to? So. Well, I would normally blindly agree with you on this, but I would say, Oshin oh, Murphy is riding unbelievably well. And he won on a horse today, that uh, race we were covering on TalkSport 2 with Lizzie Kelly on Tactician. I don't know how the hell he got that horse to win. He had no business winning from the position he was in. Um, and he's doing that on a regular basis. He's just winning on horses that do not have a right to win these races. Now, it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that Oshin oh, Murphy's brilliance is going to outfox Ryan Moore here on Kiprios, and I think this is a different Kiprios as well. This is now the fully race-fit Kiprios who's back to his best, as opposed to last year they were just getting him back. But Oshin is riding so well, I would not rule anything out. No. And he just, he's just, the thing about Kiprios is he's hes totally rounded. Like, he can stay. We know he stays, like, two mile four because he's won the Gold Cup. But you know, it's mad at, at Royal Ascot. He quickened up to a finishing speed percentage of nearly 105%, which is just madness to think that a horse that is running over two and a half miles can quicken up that much, posting a top speed of 38.38 miles per hour. Well, it's probably downhill. I mean, it's kind of, you know, but still, like, it's just, (laughs) you kind of go, this horse has everything. And especially where the comp, it's more like what beats him as well. Like, it's not just him being an excellent racehorse what beats him but like, i can't i can't see how anything in this race has shown anything that would suggest otherwise so you're saying he's a good thing and he should be formed in thrown into every single multiple you're doing if you're doing a single and resilient make it a double with kiprios <laughs> well yeah i think look i mean i don't i don't know it's so easy just to look at the form if if troll if trollerman was in there it, i think it'd be a different story i think they've got unfinished business but with Coltrane second favourite, like, do we really think, like, Kiprios has literally got to turn up with COVID, surely, to, like, to get me. Do you know what I mean? Like, not just a cold. A cold and he'd be fine. He's going to have the full bone, like, flu. Like, a COVID-free Kiprios is the Paige Fuller guarantee. Buying money, that's what Paige is saying. She's staking her entire reputation and the race iq data's reputation on it as well sign up to jeff banks now and just 
buy yourself some free money. Not a guarantee. Terms and conditions apply. Battery's not included. He wins. And he's gone into the what, what, me as well. What would you think would beat him, though? Like, in, I don't in think reality, anything can beat him. It's funny you mention it. The only horse I think that can beat him is Trollerman on Champions Day, if they decide to go back for that race. And I'm not so sure he's going back there. I would think they'll go for the this, the Irish St. Ledger, and back for the Prix de Cateran, and then say, thanks very much, we're back next year. Mm. So I don't think he'll be beaten this year. He's the best stayer in training, um, for sure. Maybe, maybe they take a tilt at the arc with him. Maybe. They did it with Order of St. George, and he ran a blinder. But I'm not so sure. They talked about it with Yates and then never did it. This episode of the Final Furlong Podcast is only possible with your support, listening and watching, and with the support of our sponsors. So give me 60 seconds to tell you about Jeff Banks' bet. Betting on horse racing used to be very simple. It was us, the punter, versus them, the bookmakers, the old enemy. But today, betting with online bookmakers is zero fun. Online betting companies promise you the world, but if you have the nerve and the audacity to place a winning bet, they will make you jump through endless hoops just to access your your cash. It is not fair and it's not fun. And betting is supposed to be fun. Jeff Banks is different. He's one of the most recognizable faces in British racing. He's got pitches at race courses all across the United Kingdom. He is a true horse racing fan. And while Jeff very much promotes responsible betting, he is standing up and fighting back against these insane affordability checks. Affordability checks that will destroy the levy and kill British racing. Sign up to jeffbanks.bet right now. Use our promo code FFP500. And not only will you get access to a bookmaker who values your custom, who is a racing fan, but he'll give you best odds guaranteed on British and Irish racing, and he'll give you 10% cash back on net losses after your first month up to £500. Gamble responsibly, 18 plus only, begambleaware.org. It's tradition refined with modern tech and unbeatable odds. Use our promo code FFP500 and place your bets now with Jeff Banks Bet. This is a paid advertisement from BetterHelp Therapy Online. Have you ever found yourself comparing your life to others? With social media, it's so easy to look at someone's Instagram and think, wow, they've got it all together. But let's be real, everyone has their struggles and often what you see online is just a highlight reel. One thing I've learned is that comparison can really steal our joy. Instead of focusing on what others have, therapy can help you center on what you want and how to achieve it. It's all about becoming the best version of yourself. Now, whether or not you've been in therapy, it's important to know that it's not just for those who've gone through major trauma. Therapy can teach you positive coping skills, how to set boundaries, and empower you in your day-to-day -day life. If you're considering starting therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online, making it convenient and flexible to fit into your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a registered therapist and you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. With almost 5,000 therapists in the UK, BetterHelp provides access to mental health professionals with a wide range of expertise. Stop comparing and start focusing on what truly matters with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash furlong today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash furlong. This has been a paid advertisement from BetterHelp Therapy Online. Two other races to talk about on, on that day, the vintage stakes. So we're really playing guessing work here in terms of who's actually going to line up. Uh, but Aidan O'Brien has won this three times in the last 10 years. He's got a horse who was going to go for the superlative stakes that City of Troy won, but came out on the day, um, the Parthenon. Uh, he's a 7-2 shot currently with most firms. Uh, Aiden won this with Highland Reel, who became one of his best ever horses. Uh, and if you are going to try to argue that, I would strongly... Dis Am I wearing the Highland Reel hat? No, I'm not. I'm wearing the St. Max Basilica hat. Uh, he's a he's a legend. I absolutely love that race horse. Um, is he one of the horses that stands out to you, or is there something else in here that you're particularly interested in? I know you were asking me about Carrot of the County beforehand. Yeah, he's... I mean, the Parthenon is... But I was I really thought he was going to run a big race in the superlative. I mean, whether to be honest, now in hindsight, I think our Ancient Truths win was very impressive. Yeah. Um but you know, he's he's actually the, the, the pair that I've picked out, they've got massive stride lengths on them as well. Like when when he was in the superlative, I was picking out I was picking him out because he had such a massive stride length when he won at the Curra. He had a peak stride length of 8.1 metres, which is like massive for a two-year-old. 
you know, this, this is like City of Troy. And then when I pulled out the data for this race or put a couple of the horses into my little code that I don't understand, but it's really useful. <laughs> uh, he, it was Cow of the County actually, who had an even bigger stride length and, or about the same, but av on average, like a bigger stride length. And it's really interesting because like this horse really stood out to me at Ascot because he just, he just throws his start away. He did it again at the Curra last weekend. Yeah. Like he just doesn't get going. He, he's slow out the stalls, like both at the Curra and Royal Ascot. This is Coward of the County. Coward of the County. He was the, the slowest out the stalls, like not really slow, like 2.95 seconds to 20 miles an hour. But he was like the slowest out of the stalls on each occasion. And then both times things happened just after the start as well. But that's because he's not going forwards. Like, you know, a horse that's going forwards out of the stall and gets ro rolling, like they won't get squeezed out. But he's not rolling because he's got such a big stride length trying to get up to speed. He just can't turn over his stride quick enough to get going quickly. And I think at Royal Ascot, he was... Um, he was, yeah, 2.95 seconds, 20 miles an hour. And then by the end of the first furlong, he was half half a second behind the eventual winner, Rashbar. So that's three lengths behind Rashbar. And he was 1.14 seconds behind the leader. So he'd given away all of that ground. And then he came rattling home. And it was the same in the Anglesey as well. He was, again, 2.95 seconds instantly um but he was the slowest out of stalls and then where he got squeezed out he just completed what was it it was um he took 20 seconds to complete the first furlong and the leader completed it in 17.5 seconds so again we're talking about like 14 of a half 14 and a half lengths behind by the end of the first furlong and it's just giving ground away and that's over six furlongs. And I just think that stepping him up to seven furlongs with his form with whistle jackets, mega. Like whistle jackets gone and boosted that form. And he's just thrown his race both times, exactly the same thing happens. And over seven furlongs, I just think this horse is crying out for seven furlongs or a mile. Um, everything about him. Oh, he definitely needs a step up and trip. He just looks slow and cumbersome early over the six furlongs and quite labored. But a little bit more trip. Um, and maybe just getting going that little bit sooner. Um, I don't know what to make of him. I was so excited about him going into Royal Ascot, and he's just, yeah, he's, he's becoming a bit of an odd one. Um, the uh, In terms of Aiden O'Brien's horse, though, you were very, very positive about him. Yeah, I was. Look, it's so difficult because he stood out, again, the sort of basic theory. So we're still learning about stride data, but effectively stride data is how a horse goes fast. So the stride length is how much ground a horse can cover with each stride. And the stride frequency is how many times that horse strides within the furlong. So strides per second. And so, you know, naturally the best horses will have the longest stride lengths because they can ca cover the most ground. And then the horses that can turn their stride over quickly, plus with a big stride length, the faster they go. So I saw the Parthenon and I went, blimey, that horse, as I say, 8.1 metres for a two-year-old peak stride length at the Curra. That's a good peak stride length for a two-year-old. So you'd like to think that suggests a bit of class about him. But then I just can't get away from Coward of the County. I found the number now. His, at the Curra last time, Coward of the County had an average stride length of 8.1 metres. So that's how much bigger his stride length. And maybe, as you say, maybe it's because he's cumbersome. Maybe the Parthenon's going to be more versatile because of it. But I just, I don't know, That's that's that was kind of my benchmark. Like, I picked out the Parthenon because he had such a big stride. And then, he, you know, again, they might not run. So, yeah, okay, if if Coward of the County doesn't run, then, yes, Parthenon's got one of the other biggest stride lengths in the race. And, you know, he's got a bit of speed as well, like the Parthenon um, clock to top speed of 41.6 miles an hour when he won um, at the Curra as well. So he's not short of speed. So that horse clearly has a bit of everything. But... I don't know. It's it's difficult. Like I, I think he's got a really good chance. But if Cowden County runs, I just think he's the value for me. He's still an eight to one shot as things stand. Uh, if they decide to run him here, go on, Joseph, do it. Go on, Joseph. You know you want to. Um, Lennox takes very briefly. I'm fascinated by Noble Dynasty. He's really turned a corner this year. I thought he was really, really good. 
at Newmarket last time out. And obviously the form at English Oak has been backed up at Royal Ascot too. Um, but this is Kinross's trip, you could argue. And he's a very, very smart horse in his day. I'd be with Noble Dynasty, but what is your data telling us? Yeah, I mean, it, it fascinates me that English Oak is joint favourite with what's the horse called? Oh, I'm gonna Noble Dynasty, isn't it? Um, sorry, mm-hmm. I'm getting all these all these uh, notable speech. Noble Dynasty, they're all kind of. I'm just going to race up now. Um, I'm being very slow with that one. Sorry. Well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that Engl- to, to me, dum dum talking to a microphone. Why uh, English Oak with an official rating of 108 against Noble Dynasty, who's got an official rating of 115, and beat him by two lengths at Newmarket, seemingly fair and square, and yet Noble Dynasty is 3-1, to one, English Oak is 4-1. to one. Oh? That is, yeah, exactly. And and the that race at Newmarket was a handicap as well. So when he beat English Oak, Noble Dynasty was running off 105, and English Oak was running off 90. So there was £15 pounds difference between them, and, they, and Noble Dynasty, so there was a stone difference... And Noble Dynasty still, as you say, beaten fair and square. And today, or sorry, not next week, they carry the same weight. So, as you say, how does that 15 length swing, I mean, 15 pound swing, like not mean that Noble Dynasty doesn't just beat him again? And there are bookmakers who are going four to one, the three Kinross, English Oak, and Noble Dynasty. I can understand Kinross. I cannot understand the English Oak thing. Now, he's a four year old. There may very well be plenty of improvement to come. And he was very, very good at Royal Ascot the last day. But he got an RPR of 117 for that. Noble Dynasty got an RPR of 117 when he beat English Oak and an RPR of 118 the last day. And again, this is a Godolphin horse that they've kept in the UK. He could be in America in the satellite yard mopping up races of this type over there. They have purposely kept him here. I think that tells you all you need to know about how good they think he is and the fact that he can win again. I'd be amazed if Noble Dynasty doesn't win this. You've actually talked me around to him. I had, I have, I have picked out Kin Ross as my as my one for this race, and I still think he's going to be the value bet because I think the money, as you say, will come in for Noble Dynasty. Like once people kind of actually look through the form, I think they'll be like, "Wow, on earth is it yeah. not shorter than English Oak?" Or maybe English Oak would just drift. I don't know, but you know, I think you are the the maths of the form makes sense for Noble Dynasty. But as you say, this is Kin Ross's trip. Like, he's a proper, like, staying sprinter, isn't he, Kinross? And, okay, again, on the bare form, you could say his run in the July Cup this year was not to the same standard as his run in the July Cup last year, but last year it was on good to soft. So it was a, it was more of a test of stamina, well, a test of stamina in a different way, if you know what I mean. Like, they went a lot harder, a lot faster this year than they did last year and it just put him under pressure like funny enough i actually compared the race sectionals even though it's different ground i compared the race sectionals because art power made the running this year in the july cup and last year so the first two furlongs this year art power covered in 0.83 seconds quicker than last year so that's like he was four lengths in front of himself this year to last year and that for a horse like kin ross who again, like you, you stay, but if you're in your top speed, like that is gonna like test your really test your stamina and just not put you put you under pressure at the wrong moment, if you know what I mean. And actually in in this year's July Cup, again, when I was pulling out of my code that I don't understand, but tells me really interesting things. Um, he <laughs> he he actually, of all the runners that I put into my code to pull out the form for, he posted the third highest top speed in that July Cup of like any of the races that any of the other horses have run in because they were going so far so early on and that's just kind of reflects to me why he didn't excel this year so you just put a line through that and then you go okay that was a very good run first time out at Newcastle very good run over six furlongs and you say seven furlongs it's just his trip he's won this last year granted on slightly easier ground but Based on his York run last season on good to firm at seven furlongs, a quick seven furlongs, I think he'll be, it'll be between him and Noble Dynasty for sure. I certainly think so, um, for what it's worth. Can I throw one at you? He's one of my favourites. Pogo, who's not getting any younger, 
but he doesn't have a huge amount of ground to make up with Noble Dynasty. He's been to Goodwood four times. He's placed on three occasions. He loves good ground, loves good to firm ground. So he sh- he will definitely get his surface. This is his trip. He's still a full horse, which is just kind of remarkable at the age of eight, and he's still going strong. Um, ran really well against Tiber Flow, get, really well against Chartash. I know he didn't quite perform at Royal Ascot, but I wouldn't hold that too much against him. And doesn't have an awful, an awful lot of ground to make up with Noble Dynasty, yet he's available at 25 to 1. He's... <laughs> Well, yeah, it's an interesting one. I don't, I haven't, haven't looked deeply into the data on him, but looking at his bare form, you could look at it either way. Yes, he's got some smart form, but Tiber Flow's been a little bit disappointing, and he was ten lengths behind Kinross last year at New York. So does that either mark down Noble Dynasty's form? the fact that he got so close to Noble Dynasty, does that actually, like looking at that form, suggest that maybe Noble Dynasty is behind Kin Ross because this horse got... But then that was last season. I mean, look, you can't compare yeah. races so far apart. But just being devil's advocate there, like I haven't I haven't looked into the date of him, so I wouldn't like to comment from that respect. But if you tie his form in with Noble Dynasty and his form in with Kin Ross... Do you know why I still have a Bet365 account? Because of backing horses like Pogo. That's why I still have a bet 365. And they're like, oh, this, this idiot. Look at this clown. Of course he can bet with us. In fact, you can bet as much as you want. Moron. Um, I, I do love him, though. I, uh, I've got a real soft spot for him. But the problem is, you can just cheer these horses on. You don't have to be putting money on them. And every now and again, I can't help myself. And then I'm, like, banging my head off the wall afterwards going, why, why did I do that? Um, to another... Potential Aiden O'Brien superstar. I do think um, superstar in the Qatar NASA stakes. We're both very, very bullish that Kinross, uh, Kinross, uh, that Kiprios is going to win. I'm pretty bullish that Henry Longfellow is going to do in the Sussex stakes page. Is like, you clown, no chance. Um, but opera singer, this is a race she needs to win to justify, pardon the pun, uh, the massive reputation that she has. She was a brilliant two-year-old. I thought she ran a cracker against Porta Fortuna over a trip that's probably short of her best over a mile at Royal Ascot the last day. How good is this horse, opera singer? It's hard to know. I think she's a really interesting prospect because I don't think she did anything special. I don't think she's done anything that special yet, personally. Um... I mean, yes, okay, okay. She has, she has been, she has been very good. She's very workmanlike. She's not very flashy. Like she doesn't inspire the imagination. But that's probably why, as you say, she's going to step up well to a mile two. But interestingly, I pulled out. I have sent you over a, a sort of sectional analysis um, from Royal Ascot. And so on this line, um, we have the orange line is Porta Fortuna. The bright blue line is Opera Singer. And the purple line is the third horse, Romatuel, and Amalka is the bright green horse. Now, I'm going to throw a curveball in because I actually think Amalka's got a really good chance in this. Oh. Um, I know. I thought, like, it's it seems a bit bonkers, but I think she's really, she runs really uninspiringly through her races because she's still so green. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, she's always slow out the stalls. She's always slightly off the bridle. Like, she's not a horse that you ever enjoy watching if you've backed her because she's just really uninspiring. Like, she never puts herself herself in the race. She doesn't tag along. She doesn't, like, I don't know, get any sort of rhythm in the race. And you can see that very much from the sectionals here. So, so this is slightly unintuitive because with sectional times, the lower the value, the quicker they're going. So when the line is going down, that means they're going quicker. And when they're going up, it means they're going slower. So interestingly, from this graph, you can actually see, I mean, as well as telling you that basically Tom Marquand wrote the most perfect, you know, fractions on Porta Fortuna. No, it wasn't. Did Was it Tom Marquand who wrote or was it Ryan Moore? Yeah. At- no, it was It was um, Ryan Moore at Newmarket, but Tom Newmarket. Marquand at Will Ascot. That's right. Sorry, just checking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can see like the orange line gets very, very steadily, steadily, quicker, quicker, quicker. And then Porta Fortuna just peaked in that second last foot a furlong. 
perfect fractions really like in my opinion looking at that line it's nice and smooth she's peaked two out whereas Romacho Ellen and Malka obviously sat a little bit further back again and Malka a bit on and off the bridle you can see she's sort of a bit more up and down on her sectionals and actually they've got to make up so much ground that they've peaked too soon they've got to use up too much speed to get into the race because they weren't stopping in front whereas in the guineas when Amalka won the guineas it actually really benefited her that she threw the she kind of threw it away a little bit at the start so she got forced to sit at the back and then because the pace collapsed in front of her she just she she outstayed them so here at Ascot where they didn't go quite as hard but she still wasn't putting herself in the race they've had to use up all that speed a furlong sooner just to get into the race and then fallen away. And Amalka actually has quite quite a good turn of foot, even though she properly, she does stay. She's got quite a turn of foot as well. So in this Ascot race, she po posted the second fastest furlong of all the runners in the race in that third last furlong. But then she stayed just as well as Opera Singer because her and Opera Singer actually completed the last two furlongs in exactly the same time. So they both completed the last two furlongs in 21 and a half seconds so in a really long roundabout way <laughs> I'm sort of thinking a little bit like Cow to the County because they aren't horses that kind of easily stay in a race early on in a race just that step up to two furlongs I think Amalka is going to be a different horse and she won the guineas like she's just everyone kind of has forgotten about her and the fact that she did win the guineas and she won a good guineas as well that guineas form is working out okay so I'm really surprised she's the price she's at. Yeah, she is a big price too. She's 14 to 1 with Jeff Banks' bet. There has been a bit of a a bit of a plot twist for this race because when Tanya Stevenson, George Gorman and I were previewing it yesterday, none of us were considering Emily Upjohn turning up here. And now suddenly this is her race and she's 2 to 1 second favourite. I think we were all just assuming, first rule of law, never assume, um, that um, in Spiral was going to be the John and Thady Gaston horse, but all of a sudden, Emily Upjohn steps forward. Uh, I'm just, I'm not, uh, 10 furlongs isn't a problem for her. She was a good second to Paddington, giving him weight in the Carl Eclipse last year. But we both talked about her earlier on, sort of offhandedly. She's not giving you the impression she's the same horse this year. No, unfortunately not. And, and we've got to remember, they are carrying half stone more than mm. the three-year-old fillies. So again, it goes back to that weight. It's like, actually, you know, she hasn't shown enough. Like, okay, yes, the Coronation Cup, she ran too free. She probably threw a race away. It was a pretty unevenly run race with Ryan Moore dictating in front. But I just, she's not reliable enough for me. You know, and okay, we've had a bit of sun on our backs now. John and Tady Gosden's also starting to come into form. There's lots to like about her, but considering how uninspiring the older mares are now, it would be really nice to think we're going to have something to spice up the division a little bit. Well, I have a sneaky feeling Opera Singer is going to end up in the arc. And if she's going to end up in the arc, she needs to be winning this. Like she needs to be winning this quite well, um, if my opinion of her is, is right. But we'll see. I think she wins this. I think this is where she'll really step forward. There's no excuses. Ten furlongs. It should be good ground. At least good ground. Um, trip is ideal. Track should be okay for her. Ground should be ideal. She's got to go do it. Uh, you have made me a little bit nervous, though. Maybe I'm curbing expectations a bit more. And El Malka is a massive price. James Doyle is going to be on board. 14 to 1. That might just be too big. That might be way too big, actually. Um, there is a, a little bit of a note of caution for opera singer as well her siblings now brave anna very talented two-year-old royal ascot winner hit it a bomb great juvenile breeders cup juvenile turf winner didn't train on no good at three three and four pence was he was okay uh, border town again just didn't do it as three-year-olds the difference between them and her they're all warfront and the Warfront project has been completely abandoned by Coolmore. You will not see any more Warfronts at Coolmore Stud, and they have no interest in spending a hundred grand on sending a mare to him anymore. Opera singers by Justify. So I would like to think that the Justify influence will change things. 
But that is a slight note of caution. These her siblings did not go forward as juveniles, having been as three year olds, having been very very good juveniles. Uh, shouldn't be an issue with her because she's running a cracker in the Irish One Thousand Guineas. She's run an absolute blinder at Royal Ascot. I think this will be her race, but just a slight note of caution. Um, final final race for us is the King George Qatar Stakes, the Group Two. Now I was assuming, again, first rule of law, never assume. Uh, you were going to be raving and waxing lyrical about the the Aussie mare and how far was she going to win by? But no, you want to talk about another horse in this? Uh, why? Well, because it would be boring to talk about the favourites in every race. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, so what is the? Point out the obvious. That horse went past us from A to B. Like <laughs> anyone can see that. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is, Tim Carroll was on the show. And I love Tim. He's a great guy. And he's got a great mind for betting as well. But he's been disowned by the Australians. He can never go back there because he said that horse could not win at Royal Ascot. Absolutely no chance because uh, she's like the 10th best sprinter in Australia. And it turns out their 10th best sprinter is just much better than ours. But the race he was saying before going to Royal Ascot that would really be ideal for her is the King George of Goodwood. So if she was good enough to be able to win the King Charles III then she really should be able to go and win this race because it'll be ideally suited to her. She's almost like a short runner, um, although obviously not at, at Royal Ascot. But the one you want to talk about, though, is Believing, who was really, really good for George Bowie and Ryan Moore the other day at the Curra. She was really good. And so um, where I was talking earlier in the show about having more sort of bringing more time analysis and time context, because, again, like I said, I'm not I'm not steeped in flat racing um analysis for years and years so you know i'm hopefully like a lot of other people that might listen to your show and want to understand a little bit more about the context of a race time because at the moment we've got the racing post standard you know it tells you it's x seconds fast or x seconds faster than what or x seconds slow and you're comparing across races and so you know our very clever data scientists um basically have compared they they have created this par time so an expected wind time and then once we've got the actual wind time we can compare that wind time against historical wind times. So by taking into consideration the track, the going, the age conditions, the class of race, you know, whether it's a handicap or, you know, two, even a two-year-old race in March compared to a two-year-old race in September, all of those sorts of things go into the mix when we're um, trying to put the context on the races. And then we project a time index, which is a score out of 10 of how good our model thinks that that race is compared to all the other races and conditions that it's seen over you know the last 10 years. Um, and so Believing is, um, she posted a 9.8. So that is like, you know, a really good race time. And look, Irish Irish um, times, you know, we, we probably don't have as complete an Irish time. So, you know, we don't probably have as many Irish times to base ourselves on because the track configurations have changed quite a lot and stuff like that. So, you know, we, but compared to five furlong races at the Curra, taking into consideration the class race, the going, et cetera, et cetera, she posted 9.88. And to me, that's a very, that's really impressive. And it wasn't just that, it was the way she did it as well. So in that race, they went very hard, but actually I think most of the horses posted their fastest furlong in the third furlong, a couple of them in the second furlong, but Ryan Moore delivered her speed at like perfect moments. So her fastest furlong was actually posted in the fourth furlong. So the second last furlong, and she posted a 10.52 second, second last furlong and finished with a finishing speed percentage of 104%. So she showed a lot of speed and, you know, maybe I'm clutching at straws, but actually, you know, she was running over six and seven furlongs before. So she's entitled to a sharpened up for running over five furlongs. And I just think that actually, potentially, like she's got an extra two pounds on us for her. I mean, Big Ed's realistically looking at it. I mean, he's getting five pounds off us for her. So he's probably the forgotten horse in this, but he's flopped a bit this season. You know, you wouldn't necessarily back him. But I don't know. I just think believing is the value there. Like, I'm not going to say she's definitely going to, oh, she's my nap and she's definitely going to turn the table around. But, you know, you can't argue with the fact that she posted a really quick time at the Curra and she's definitely improved for stepping back to five furlongs. I'm even just a little bit taken aback by the 
the pricing. Uh, Jeff Banks bet goes 11 to 4. I think when I did that feature with, with Tim Carroll, and then you see her win at Royal Ascot, your immediate assumption is, oh, she's going to be a very, very short price favorite. But they obviously feel the same as you because believing is four to one. Big Evs, who ran a big race at Royal Ascot, I thought was beaten fair and square on the day. And there's maybe a question mark as to how effective he can be as a three year old compared to how good he was as a juvenile. Um, seven to two. But they don't, they're seeing it like you. This is not a straightforward thing as, oh, the Australian mare is just better than everything else and she'll win. They don't see it that way. They're prepared to dangle that 11 to four carrot, which I think most people will, will want to take. Yeah, it's oh look, it's it's a very tight race. Like, and I am clutching at straws because you know we haven't got that much to go on. You know, she was beaten. You know, yes, Asfora was beaten at Haydock, but it was soft. You know, maybe we're being harsh on her because we've literally seen mm. her once before that, and she got beat. And we we can't. How do you rate Australian form? Like as you say, she's probably a slightly short runner, so of course she's not going to win over five furlongs at Haydock on soft ground. Like <laughs> no way. But it's, I think it's it's got to be that. Like she is, she is probably, she is entitled to be favourite. But if you're trying to look at a little bit of value in the race, you know, I she we wouldn't be backing her as I wouldn't personally back her as a favourite. Believe in believing is what Paige Fuller is saying. Four to one is the price currently with Jeff Banks bet. Uh, we know who your nap is. Pretty obvious, Rosalian. There's no talking about of that, and I, I wouldn't even dare try. But uh, I will send you a message when Henry Longfellow wins. Going, told you. Um, but who is the next best for Page Fuller? Um, that is a good question. I I think I'd like to see. I'd like. I really like to see Ken Ross win, mostly because you know, again, it's it's really nice to think that. You know, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I, I just I think Kinross. I think Kinross will bounce back to it, based on his form last season. I can't see like why he wouldn't be back at that level. And I do think the others have got a little bit to prove to get to his like actual consistent level. There'll be lots of wearing... told you texts coming my way. <laughs> I am wearing a blue <laughs> shirt. It's the Godolphin blue noble dynasty dynasty, whichever pronunciation you want to go for. But uh, that's okay. That's fine. It's fine. It's a game of opinions. And if we all agreed on everything, then it would be an incredibly boring sport. Uh, Paige, I really appreciate your insight and your time on the show today. It's fascinating as always. I love the fact that we get to talk about flat racing as well as jumps racing. Where can people learn more about race IQ data? So at the moment, um, I'm, I'm obviously running the Twitter account. So we try and sort of get out as much information as we can through there obviously it's just kind of me putting it out on there at the moment so you know if there's things that people really want to know we'll see without like completely inundating myself by saying this but you know just get in touch on twitter and i can you know uh just let people know what i think if i can and then sectional times etc they're all available on the racing tv website and we are building out the technology that in you know a few months' time, hopefully people will have more access to the data. But at the moment, it's just a case of Rome wasn't built in a day. And it does very much feel like Rome sometimes when you're like trying to learn about not that I have to deal with the APIs and stuff, but I just didn't actually realize how much went into like building technology and stuff. So as you have heard from my coding that I don't really understand. So <laughs> like it's um it is coming for people. So I'm hoping that people will be able to do a lot of this analysis themselves in time. Um, but it's just a case of, yeah, hopefully soon. Well, I'm a man and all men are fascinated by ancient Rome, but I'm like one of those people who, after the fall of Rome 20 years later, is looking at the viaducts and going, how did they make the running water? How did that? How did they do that? Because all that was lost, the data, how they did it. I'm like that for the race IQ data or for your coding. I don't have a clue how you do this. But it's not my coding. By it. Just to clear it up, it's all the very clever data scientists that have been to, I don't know, one of our data scientists has been to Cambridge, Oxford, and further trained somewhere in America as well. Like, just so, like, insanely, <laughs> insanely qualified. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> achieved a slightly more in life than I have and has a brain that can compute all of that information, whereas I'm like one of those people in Rome going, how did, how did they make the running water work? How did that happen? Um, 
Fascinating stuff, Paige. Really enjoyed it. And looking forward to talking to you again soon on the Final Front Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching and for listening to the uh, latest episode of The Final Furlong. If you like this, likes and shares on social media are much appreciated. Apparently, I'm supposed to be saying this at the start of the show. Have you pressed the like button? That's what all the YouTubers say. Uh, don't say it till the end. We don't ask you for much, so hit the like button. Hit that button there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we're back again with more content very, very soon. Hopefully, you enjoyed this episode, and hopefully, you'll enjoy the content still to come. From Paige Fuller and me, Amos Kennedy, look after yourself and each other. God bless. The Final Furlong Podcast is proudly brought to you by Jeff Banks Bet. Join the excitement and sign up to Jeff Banks online now to get 10% off any net losses returned as cash after your first month of betting up to £500 at jeffbanks.bet.